tell us about the new Bowen. All right, then. Um, I think it's number 292. Uh, Ralph is not that prolific, Ralph Bowen, the maker <laughs> of this guitar, but uh, they're all very wonderful and have unique characters, and it's always lovely discovering a new one. You know, I, I, I'm a fan of the 80s ones. Um, uh, this is brand new off the shelf in May 2023, and it's a real beast of a thing. <laughs> Already it's starting to open out in the bottom end, you know. What I normally find on an acoustic guitar is that, you know, the famous B flat A G sharp area sounds huge. All that stuff. And then they disappear once you get down, you get this kind of and they're quiet there. But this one just, you know, just seems to have opened up a little early and the tops are quite bright and I've been gigging it. I've been playing throughout the summer and you know, giving it some stick. And it's, yes, opening out beautifully. The uh, back and sides are made of Madagascan rosewood. It's quite straight grain. Um, Sitka spruce top. Bit of snakewood binding, and I think well, I think that's a Honduras mahogany neck with an ebony fingerboard. Not quite sure. I usually put um, phosphor bronze strings on this guitar, but I only had a set of eighty twenties <laughs> in my bag, so uh, yeah, it sounds slightly more mellow than it normally does. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great little instrument. It's an OMX size, which is about I don't know a half an inch wider and deeper than an OM. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, do you do you have any sort of special premise, uh, special requirements that you put into a handbuilt guitar? Um, it needs to be easy to play. <laughs> you know, you just go. You know, how, how does the neck feel? That's that's critical, really. You know, mm. the last thing you want to be worrying about when you're playing a show is pressing the notes down. You want to try and deliver the show, and it just all needs to be there and easy to play. You know, um, so it, uh, w when I was starting out on this Remborn project, actually, you know, for, for this double album, I've just um, recorded and mastered yesterday. Uh, I was fortunate enough in the early days of this project to be loaned John Remborn's Gibson J50, which is on the front cover of the album Another Monday, where he's sitting on the steps there. Mm. I understand years ago that uh, um, with the royalty he was given after the first album. It was a, it was enough money to buy himself a new suit and a Gibson J50 <laughs> for the next record. Um, but I did notice on that guitar that the width of the nut was only like you know a Gibson J50 uh, nut width is something like forty one millimeters. Right. You know, super narrow, great mm. for strumming, and it's you know big body. It's you know really suits a certain way of playing. But I must, I mean, you know, it must be pretty tricky for Remborn to perform all of those very delicate contrapuntal medieval influenced pieces on that narrow neck there. I think he moved on to a guild for a short while. Was, I think the J50 was in an accident and certainly on John's later guitars the uh, nut width started to widen and widen and on my other Ralph Bound guitar it's 45 and a half millimeters and this one's I've, I've gone to 46 <laughs> to, to the dark side but uh, it makes the voice separation really enjoyable rather than trying to squeeze your fingers in and out of those inner parts especially yeah. mm. so. and you were saying earlier that you've not got a pickup fitted to, to not at the yet. moment no i mean that was you know dare i mention you know the covid era but like a lot of my colleagues we started playing from our own living rooms and um and i didn't plug in you know i just had a couple of mics there and hooked it up to my laptop and off, off i went and Playing mic only probably changed the way I delivered a performance, actually. So much so that um, for my first tour post that era, which was, I think, you know, April last year, I think it was, um, I asked a friend of mine, Roland, over in Germany, you know, what would be a great pair of mics that, that, that isn't a, a pair of, you know, paired Neumanns, you know, I couldn't see myself bringing a pair of KM184s down the dog and duck, you know. <laughs> uh, but I tell you, there's a great uh, pairing of bikes I had by a company called Lion Audio. Uh, they're called CM4s. They're from Sweden. Um, not mega expensive. And I found it really liberating, actually. Um, not only did I start touring with 
uh, three guitars, but I was able to change between them without having to, you know, mute button, pick up out, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I love, you know, if I play some bigger shows, then yeah, the two mics just don't hold up. I need, you know, either just pick up with a mic inside the guitar or a pick up mic, external mic combination. But for, you know, the shows I play, which is, you know, 100 seat or art centers, I tell you, it's so liberating just playing mic only, you know. Um, mm. So I have one there, you know, probably a bit closer for live. For recording, you can move them back a little, but um, you yeah, know, one facing you know, 14th fret area, one round here, you know, 11 o'clock, one o'clock, slight pan in the PA so that if you're moving around like this, there's a slight shimmer in the live sound. And then I have a blue sky reverb unit. I just do kind of, you know, a line in and out loop with a bit of reverb and that's it. So I can switch between steel string guitar, pick up the nylon. There's no awkward, you know, unplugging or forget forgetting to press mute. And then I've been touring as well with uh, baritone guitar. So I've got the OM steel string, the nylon string and the baritone. So it feels good and it's easy. And, and, the, and I play differently. And the microphones cope with the baritone as well. Oh yeah, this, yeah, that's it. Once it's set, it's cool, you know. I know the baritone is louder than the others, but that's part of the affecting the gig as well. You're playing OM for 15 minutes, all of a sudden you pick up this guitar Mageddon beast and <laughs> people are blown away by the power of the thing. And so, you know, I give it a bit of that and then I can back off, of course, you know, which is something you can't do with an, with an internal system. Mm. Can you give us a couple of sound examples of the... Um, I mean, we've got the pieces top and tail. But, oh, yeah, sure. um, just, a, just a couple of little examples of the good points of the new bound. On the good points of the new bound? Um, well, I can uh, couple it with some Rembornisms, if you like. You yeah. Um, so... For example, on his more medieval influenced pieces, you can hear the voice separation really clearly and it's it's enjoyable to play rather than struggling, especially with those inner voicings. So you get something like uh, The Lady and the Unicorn. Voicings were quite clear in that, you know. A darker one like Pavan de Aragon by John, for example. Yeah. Hopefully, are quite clear. You know. Down to the third string, top, bass up, bass, uh, sustain, and then. And then, third string, I'm thinking of. be able to do that on a narrow neck guitar that no. kind of voice separation yeah it's almost you know it's not quite as wide as a classical neck mm. uh, but there again it kind of feels a little classical but um, but because the strings are not as thick as nylon it almost yeah, you can still get the separation but with a slightly thinner neck yes yeah, kind of but, enjoyable right now back in 2021 I had time 
you know, we all had time, you know, to, um, and there were certain pieces I'd always wanted to play, uh, and I was thinking about John's pieces one afternoon, picked up a book of his tunes, I had lying around all some of his manuscripts, I think, and I, you know, I'd always wanted to know the lady in the unicorn. You know, just you know, it was a famous piece, sounded pretty beautiful, so I thought I'd just sit down, you know, chuck it on the music stand and and sight read it. Uh, another one was the Hermit, and then you know, I played Lady Goes to Church on CD, and I thought, well, that's you know, that's pretty cool as well. And then my curiosity started to expand, and all of a sudden I'd learnt. The you know, the Pelican, Buffalo, which is a Kenny Doran piece that Davy Graham probably learned, you know, from the original LP that everyone had to play back in the early 60s. Um, and then, you know, the Burton John pieces were cool. I'd listened to the album a lot, but I hadn't bothered learning No Exit or Red's Favourite or Orlando, that kind of thing. Um, and all of a sudden I had, you know, close to an album's worth of music under my fingers. I thought, well, you know, I've got quite an unusual connection in John in that I spent a lot of time with him. Well, because of this unique position that I was, that I was in, I thought I could, you know, I, I can play the notes. Obviously, I, I don't sound like John. And with this project, I've tried to do something different with every piece as well. I think that's the right thing to do. And I think historically we're in a unique position, obviously, um, but I'm thinking specifically because the acoustic guitar repertoire is still quite young, mm. isn't it? You know, mm. unlike the classical repertoire, or you know, the music you can draw upon, or the, the you know, the early music into Renaissance, Brock, classical, you know, early, mid, late Romantic. You've got all that that works great on the nylon string guitar, um, but there's not so much for steel string. In actual fact, a lot of the players on this instrument are music creators, unlike m the majority of classical players who are interpreters. Mm. You know. So uh, only perhaps, you know, you've got early blues players and then you've got, you know, kind of the, the swing thing. Rembourne loved the scarf guitar, the dance band guitar. Um, then I tend to think of, you know, 50s, 60s as being a really important compositional era, era in the history of the acoustic guitar. So I think John's music is special because he drew, you know, like the pre-Raphaelites in the late 19th century drawing inspiration from, you know, art pre-Raphael, you know, mm. and anti-industrial um, artwork and that whole era. I think John kind of did the same thing, right, you know, so the fact that he started writing music that was, you know, loosely based on medieval music and, you know, a little bit of Renaissance and a bit before that as well, you know, I think because it was written in the 60s, it has that almost pre-Raphaelite-esque stamp on it that couldn't be achieved at any other time. You know, there was no one. The steel string guitar wasn't really happening at the same time as the pre-Raphaelites, and it certainly wasn't happening on the nylon string. Well, musically, for the most part, you might get people like Eric Satie, for example, springs to mind. You know, and then and maybe Stravinsky writing the right of spring in 1913, 17, something like that. But at the same time, you've got all this blue stuff coming out of the southern states. You know. um, so, because of my connection with John and realizing the importance of this music he created, I thought it was time that someone took it to a, a new generation. So that's why I've done it. And it's a double CD. It's a double, yeah. It's ended up being a double CD. It could go on. I mean, after John passed, after John died in 2015, um, Newcastle University were allowed to extract the Remborn filing cabinets and chests that contained, well, up till now, over 10,000 pages of, um, what do you call it, microfilmed composition. Mm. Yeah, that's that's quite an output. So most of John's music is still hasn't been recorded. In actual fact, there's a, a piece I re-recorded for the 2006 film Driving Lessons that features Julie Waters and Rupert Grint. You know, um, uh, John and myself wrote the soundtrack for that film, and <clears throat> so I I had a connection to this piece called a Stampede. 
already, but I wanted to do something different with it for this project. Um, so, you know, for the film, I stuck pretty closely to the John's album version. The album is Traveller's Prayer, and it's on that is I think it's two acoustic, two steel string guitars and bass clarinet, a couple of other clarinets and a percussion sound. Uh, I believe it was like you know the bass drum effect on a Casio keyboard or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. very medieval. But um, when I managed to get hold of the original Remborn manuscript of a stampede, he wanted more of a Moorish flavour. So I, I had some more you know. North African sounding percussive instruments on it and instead of the clarinets I've substituted those for um, uh, bass regular and regular flute actually, bass flute. Have you ever seen one of those? I can imagine that. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like that's not a knife, you know, <laughs> it's like here and it's got a big curve, it's like a drain pipe, you know, the sky is like this. You know. I wanted a, band, a pair of Bansuri flutes which were, you know, quite prevalent in the Middle East in the 12th century, but they're pretty hard to keep in tune, <laughs> so I stuck with flute. But I used a, a great flute player called Paul Chenard, um, who's a, a UK-based flute player who can, you know, who plays all those other instruments as well. But yeah, we decided to stick to the the bass flute, mm. but he still managed to create that kind of Moorish flavour for me. So yeah, um, so, so I've got some yeah some Turkish percussion, some some flute and guitar and also he also wanted electric guitar so why not you know he probably just didn't bring an electric guitar to the session uh, for that original Traveller's Prayer album so you know I just strung up the old Telecaster and, and I laid down some nylon string parts so yeah. So the album has got uh, quite a, a selection of different guitars on there. You have, have, did you have the Bowen at the time? The new I did one? yeah yeah you I did. used this I used this on a few tracks um, I also, you know, I own John Remborn's bound guitar, OM bound guitar, so I use that on a bunch of tracks, and I use the baritone, which is a Rob Armstrong baritone, uh, and nylon string, Philip Woodfield, I've got Philip Woodfield nylon string, which is great, you know. Uh, in actual fact, you know, a piece like Old McBladget, which is a play on the word, the phrase Old Black Magic, uh, I think it's from Remborn's album The Hermit. Um, which originally, I think it's like, he wrote it out in something like, you know, open G minor, but it's in G major, or something crazy like that. But there's a, uh, there's a close friend of Remborn's called Remy Frossarth, who lives down near Toulouse, somewhere in France, um, who, you know, is a, is a huge fan of Remborn's, and he can play the stuff, and he transcribed Old McBladget into standard tuning. So I thought it'd be a great take to try and record it on the nylon string. I think it worked quite well. It has that kind of late romantic vibe to it, which shows the breadth of Remborn's curiosities, really, you know, mm. from pre-medieval through to late romantic and swing. Do you have mm. a, a favourite track of John's to perform? Like now or, or no, just no, in general? No, no, in general? Just... Um, no, I, I'm enjoying playing all of them right now. A, a, a special a special track is one called Intrada and Dance Royale, and that's why I mentioned that a stampede piece about <laughs> three hours ago, <laughs> is because you know I was fortunate to see the original score for a stampede, but in the same folder was this intro and dance royale that was supposed to accompany a stampede. It was never recorded, so fortunately I got permission from the family, the Remborn family, to record this brand new piece, you know, a brand new recording, a first time recording of, of this little coupling of medi in, medieval influenced music, but uh, it's not for guitar. I mean, I played a pair of guitars and some electric bass on it, but it's actually for um, early music ensemble. So I got a whole medieval ensemble on it. Yeah. With bass guitar? With bass guitar, naturally, yes. The Remborn vibe is it's the, the late 60s touch. <laughs> it went straight from authentic medieval to, you know, nineteen late 1960s Robin Hood <laughs> in one pluck. 